And in, in the morning session here, we will at first talk about software testing. And uh, this will be taught uh, by uh, Luca Franti. So perhaps you, you can introduce yourself. Yeah, hi, I am Luca. I was also exercise leader last week, so someone saw me problem. I'm yeah, PhD student at the University of Vasa and I code quite a lot. I like it and I like to promote the good coding practices because I think it's very important and hopefully we'll have some fun together today and learn something new together. So very excited to be here. Yeah, thank you, Luca. And, and also I, uh, you won. I, I, I was uh, teaching um, the Jupiter episode with, with the tour yesterday. Also, I will now uh, be teaching in, in software testing. So um, in this lesson, we'll discuss why software need, testing needs to be an integrated part of uh, software development and how we can set up workflows to implement such a cycle. We will see how in automated testing works. We'll practice design tests and how to write tests. And the only prerequisite for doing the exercises is in, in this lesson today is that you have PyTest up and running. Then, um, as we mentioned uh, before nine o'clock here, uh, this is a lesson where we have a lot of content. So we will explore some of it today, but there are also many other exercises that we will not have time to cover. And you're very welcome to have a look at them at a later point. And you then have the chance to uh, select and work with the language, which is the most relevant one for your um, software project or your use case. And for each of these uh, softwares, there are various tools available that we will briefly present. But from the, at the start now, we will talk about, about the concepts which are generic and apply to all programming languages. So um, in the experimental sciences, testing in calibration of your equipment is something which is a profound thing. And it's very important that you do it because if you haven't calibrated your instruments, how can you then have confidence in that the things that you measure are, are, are sound? And moreover, you also have, uh, if you do measurements with some instrument, uh, could be like uh, in, in physical sciences that you measure some distance, you measure some weight. You will of course have some accuracy, which is limited. You might also have some statistical variations. In software development and use, similar things are important. So it's very important that, that uh, one have a workflow in developing and using a, pro a program or a set of programs to make confidence in that the programs are run with as few or down to ideally, so to say, zero known bikes. And the examples of when these have been going wrong, of course. Uh, we have posted a question here in, on, on HackMD, and uh, I would like to highlight a few examples from when that this has gone wrong uh, on, on a large scale. So we have here an example. This has happened some 20 years ago. It was a mishap at a NASA mission with a satellite that was sent out to orbit March. And different teams at NASA have been working with it, with this so-called NASA orbiter. And they had one team that was working with uh, metric units and another one with English units of measurements. And somehow this was overlooked during all of this uh, engineering process. So they came all the way to launching the satellite into, into approaching its orbit around March before this was happening. And uh, eventually then the the satellite was lost. So this was a very spectacular incident that happened due to inadequate testing of calculations that were done in, in software. So other motivation in, in uh, to, to, individual, to the software projects can be that 
if you are relying on, on numerical simulations or data analysis in, in your projects and something is wrong with these programs, then clearly it's so that if you have obtained results that you thought were sound and you have communicated them, if it then turns out that something was not done appropriately due to an error in the, in the program, then uh, you might need to take a step back and say that, sorry, these are results that are erroneous and we need to, uh, we need to uh, retract the results that might then even have been published in a journal. So, so what is testing? So in a nutshell, it concerns comparing observed results with established and expected results. So to take a simple example here, we have a code snippet here in Python. It's a function here for a night to Celsius where we calculate, we take an input argument, namely the temperature in Fahrenheit, and then this function calculate what is the temperature on the Fahrenheit scale. This is a simple function, uh, one input argument, one output variable. We have this arithmetic here on one line. To accompany this function, we have here a test function, test underscore Fahrenheit to Celsius. And uh, the name here indicates that this fun test function is uh, connecting to this very function in the program. It also has a certain uh, meaning as regards pi tests because functions in Python, which are have a name that start with test underscore, will be uh, caught by pi test and executed as, as tests. So what is done here is that we define here that we have one specific input, namely, the temperature 100 uh, Fahrenheit. And uh, we have an expected result, namely 37.7 Celsius. Then we have an assert statement that will compare that the obtained result, temp underscore C, differs from the expected result with a number which is smaller than a given numerical tolerance, which we have set to one part per million. So uh, why, what, what, what can helps, uh, help uh, be useful for? So if we have a small program, it is perhaps possible to just by visual inspection conclude that the program is doing what it is expected to do. But if you have a large program, all of a sudden it is so that it's much more difficult to follow if something breaks when we are perhaps adjusting the program or we're running the program in another setting. So testing then is, is a good means to uh, help detect errors early. Um, it is important uh, in general for all software, but in, in, in the context of scientific software, it has a special uh, so it's a special purpose because it's connected very closely to reproducibility. One important notion is that program testing can be used to show the presence of bugs, but never to show the absence. This is very important to, to, to keep in mind. So even, so this goes in principle and, and also on a more practical level, it's so that if you have a program with, with a large state space and a large input space, then uh, you could not even hypothetically exhaust all options and, and all variants of, of executing the program. So, so, so in fact, it would not be possible to test it all. But you can do some, you can test some uh, bits and pieces and some of the most relevant use cases and establish then confidence is that these parts are working. There's an interesting discussion happening. Uh, as you showed the, like, uh, that you had the function and a test function for it, uh, do, you test, uh, do you have a test function for each function or how do you choose which one deserves to be tested? Do you think there can be code which is uh, too trivial to be tested or is there a limit where careful testing becomes pedantic? What do you think? 
I, I think that uh, all functions, if, if, if they're simple, if they are part of let's say, the, the kernel of a program, then it's good to have the ambition to test them. If you have something which is small and standalone, so for instance, a, a smaller script that is doing some plotting, and let's say you, you have, you know your raw data, you have it in tabular format, you know that the data ranges from, let's say, 10 up to 30 along one uh, axis. If you then plot and everything is nicely then matching, I mean, what, what is in the figure and, and, and what you have in, in the table, then I would say perhaps no additional software implemented tests are, are needed, but, and, and then it would be enough with optical inspection. Had a funny discussion about this with a colleague a short time back. I wrote a very simple function that was computing the absolute value of the number, like manually, like check if it's positive and if it's positive, return the same. And if it's negative, flip the sign and then ask him, uh, do you think I implement it correctly? Would you need to test? And he was pretty sure. No, no, this is correct. I mean, come on, it's trivial. It's just the formula, the code is the same. You don't need to test. But then I took the, um, the biggest, uh, the smallest possible negative integer. And when it flipped it, it overflowed. And so it failed in that case. And so, well, that wasn't trivial in the end. So even trivial tests can have like, trivial code can have like some subtle things which are very difficult to detect. Yeah, that, that, that's, I a, guess. Yeah, that, that's a very nice, nice example, the one that you brought up. Yeah, I guess testing is almost an art. Yes, yeah, it is. Um, I mean, no, not, not least because testing is something that we often pursue with a limited amount of resources as, as regards uh, staff hours. So, so probably you need to, to, to be a bit selective on, on, on where you are devoting your energy for doing it. So how about who, which actors can, can benefit from testing? So, so we have here, if you break it down, so we have um, how users can uh, benefit from testing. And um, there are a few aspects here. So, so if you have some kind of test suite, which is run when a program has been installed and, and run for the first time in the system, if this passes with, with all green flags, then that gives you confidence in that the program is now executing correctly. Uh, as such, and also more that is executing correctly on my machine. So that's a very important thing. Uh, moreover, it also gives them confidence for that work which is produced with this code, um, also for third parties, that they can see that this we, we can you can assume that the tool is doing what it's supposed to do. So how about the, how tests can, can help developers, Luca? What, 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 what can we say about that? Yeah, I think uh, the greatest benefit for developers uh, is that you don't uh, accidentally, accidentally break things. Uh, that you, know, you have uh, your code, which has some features, uh, and then you add some new features and then you say, yeah, I mean, this is just a new feature. It's definitely not going to break it, anything else. But well, sometimes it does, it can break other things. So I think it helps developers to avoid the regressions that you don't uh, accidentally take one step ahead and 10 steps back. It uh, helps you keep track that you don't accidentally break other things. And uh, yeah, that's, I think, the greatest benefit of testing yeah. or well, why I, 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 maybe? Yeah, I, I, I what agree. What about you? Yeah, no, I, I agree. Uh, this is, this is, I would say this is a central thing. Yeah. Uh, one, one particular thing that we can highlight is that the tests can uh, help um, if you wanted to refactor a code. So perhaps you have a code which has been written at first as, as a prototype. Perhaps you didn't know at, at the beginning that you were going to use this for a longer time. And then you, so to say, got stuck with that code. Then if you want to do something to completely rewrite it, perhaps even write it in another language, writing from scratch, or writing it as new modules within the, the same uh, code base, 
It's very good then if you have the tests available, because then you can quickly establish uh, that, okay, the new implementation of a given functionality is doing what the older implementation was already doing correctly. That connects a bit to what you said, Luca, that, that you quickly get a thumbs up or a thumbs down for did my new code break something? There's, yeah, this is a very interesting question. Uh, how do you know that your tests don't have bugs? So who watches the watchman? When you write tests, you trust your tests. So how, do you, how can you be sure that your tests don't have bugs? So Yes. That, that's it. How do you, because actually, I don't know, it's in my code, like if I really address that problem or how I would address that. So do you just trust your tests or do you have tests for tests or? Yeah, in, in, in principle, did this um, can, can, cannot be fully yeah. resolved, but, but the one thing that can be done is for instance that you, if you want to uh, establish what is the reference data for correct execution of some function, if you can arrive to the reference data by some independent means. So for instance, if it concerns some arithmetic calculation, perhaps you have some base case, which you can do with pen and paper. Then that I would say is rather distinct from, from having uh, reference data only from numerical computation. And, uh, Could also be that if it's all about numerical computation, that it might be that you can use another kind of algorithm. Yeah. So um, tests can help manage complexity. So having tests in mind, we uh, can uh, that that can guide the thought when we're writing the code. Because if you keep in mind that, okay, we are going to need to test this new function that I'm writing, then I design the function so that it will be testable. So to give a simple example here, we're going back to the temperature conversion. We have here that this is a pure function. We have an input argument and we have an output variable. And the constants are baked into this function here. If you have code where you have some reliance on, on external parameters, namely this offset variable here and this factor variable here, then it's very difficult to make a, um, a clean test of this function because the outcome of a test for the function will rely upon what values we have for these variables here. So I, I would say personally that it's perfectly fine that you have some constants which are global in a program. So that could be, for instance, so, some, uh, I mean, mathematical contents like, like pi. I mean, there's only one pi. You, you can have it as a constant stored with, with a given number of uh, uh, digits of, of precision. So we will now come and illustrate uh, some various form of tests. And we are then going to get going with exercises on, on one kind of tests. So uh, the one test that, that we already saw an example of is a so-called unit tests, which tests um, a module or even a single function. And this is something that you ideally could then have for all bits and pieces of, of your program. But if this is too much, then you can select uh, what are the most core functionalities of the program and you have unit tests for them. But at the test then that for any reasonable input, you have some expected output and the function will, will return them. The next step is to add on all integration tests. So um, taking, for example, for, for, from uh, the production of, of a car, so you have various components in a car. You have a battery, 
you have a motor, you have a, a gearbox, you have the, the steering system. So you can have units tests for all of these, but it's not enough for these units to operate correctly on their own. They also need to be able to function together. And that's where integration tests come in. Also here, it can be good if you can uh, arrive to some reference data by other means. Uh, so let's say <laughs> a base zero case for, for a car would, for instance, be this that uh, you have a appropriate linking from, from, the, from the control uh, of the, I mean the, the gas pedal and, and the brake pedal to the engine. And when you are using these pedals, the engine and the car will move accordingly. So a third category of, of tests are the so-called regression tests. They operate on the whole code base, just like uh, integration tests do, but uh, you use them in a different situation. And that's namely when you are at a stage that you have an operating program that is doing some job correctly, then regression tests compare for new variants of the code or the code being used in new settings that the program is still doing what it did earlier with some outcome. So, so note here that the earlier outcome, which is your reference data, you I mean, when designing re regression test, you, you must not necessarily have um, in complete insight in, in what this reference data is for setting up regression tests. Uh, but you, you can set them up then uh, nevertheless. And when you're running the request and test for a new version of the program, you can then uh, make credible that the program for the given set of tests executes as it did with an earlier version of the program. This is something which is used very much in, in every day for larger code bases that you run, for instance, on, on high performance computers. So uh, there it is very convenient if you can get a regression test suite launched right after installing the, the program on the computer. That gives you a, a quick confidence in that things are working. So um, finally, two categories which we'll mention briefly before we move on with, with practicals is that you have test-driven development. Uh, we already touched upon this, and this is this that you keep testing in mind when designing and implementing the functionality of your code. Uh, this could also be, and this is happening in larger organizations, you, you might have a separate team or even department who are working on setting up these tests, and they have some specifications, and they do their job completely independent of, of the software development unit who are doing their job. Continuous integration is a concept which is uh, very important. Uh, and we will try it out here uh, as part of the episode on automatic testing. And that means that you test every single new addition to the code uh, continuously. So each time you commit something or you consider to commit something, you run a test. So the testing is continuous. Code coverage is um, a concept and a technique for getting insight in how large part of the code are you testing. And for large program, it's clear that perhaps you might not be able to test all of it. And it might be difficult to assess yourself how much part of the program did I actually test. But then there are actually very powerful tools that can do this job for you. So they can even give you down to individual lines of code, insights on which lines of code were tested and which lines of code were, were not touched upon during the, the, the tests. Do you use a test-driven design in your work? Have you used it? Have you tried using it? 
yes, but 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 not but not in in, in a very rigorous way. It, it's more that I test on the go rather that, than that I write down all the tests uh, beforehand. So I look here on the schedule, and I think it's now time that we move on to do some uh, yeah. practicals. And uh, what we'll do then is that uh, you look at, you will demo how to do the work with yeah. PyTest. Uh, yeah, and we will use PyTest uh, now, but uh, what if some people use different languages? If someone, for example, works with C++, do you have suggestions where they would find uh, some material for yes, other languages? That, that, that's good you mentioned, yes. Uh, then let's take a step back. So I'll scroll back up and uh, the lesson and uh, show here that we have a reference page here at the very bottom of the lesson, quick reference. Where we have a brief description of various tools. So for Python, we have PyTest, R, TestHat, and Julia. How is it looking? In Julia, it's, it's built in. Uh, yeah, it's built in, but it's not exported by default. So you need to import the library, but it's in the built in. Yeah, this test library. Yeah. For uh, C and uh, C. Um, and also for Fortran, there are a large number of tools. Uh, we, we did in an earlier workshop uh, that was running also with a hackathon for testing. We were using then mainly the CAT2 framework. And for Fortran, we were using the EFUnit tool. So these are tools that you can consider to have a look on, but, but uh, all, all of these are good tools. So, so, so please consider all of them. So I just moved back here to testing locally. And now I think you can perhaps take the screen share, Luca. Yeah. Okay, so I start sharing my screen. Yeah, can you see my uh, terminals? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. So uh, we will go in a second in the breakout rooms uh, and you will get the opportunity to uh, play a little with PyTest. But uh, here we will have a, a very quick overview just on how PyTest work. And well, Johan has already given a short demo, but uh, let's now create a simple file. I'll call it uh, simple file. And uh, let's create a simple function. Suppose now it's uh, morning, so we want a function that uh, tells us good morning. So let's say def greet, this greet function, which just returns good morning. But now uh, we are tired and uh, summertime has just started. We are a little confused. And so accidentally we actually write good afternoon. Okay. Now, uh, if you want to test functions with the uh, PyTest, the function should start with the test underscore and then match the name of the function. And then if you want to assert, to check that uh, the returned value of the function matches some ground truth that you have from somewhere, use the keyword assert. So, well, indeed you assert, that this uh, greet returns the string. Uh, uh, well, now it should return good morning. So that's what we want to check. Okay, let's save this. And now uh, to test the file, we do pytest simple file. So do you have pytest readily available in your Python environment? Uh, yes, I have installed it, and you can verify that you have installed by doing, for example, pytest dash dash version, and we will print the version which you have. If you don't have it installed, you can install it with pip. So pip install pytest. There's a yeah. question from chat. Should you be coding along now? 
Uh, no, not necessarily. You, uh, so yeah, I'm sorry for not reminding it, but this just to give a taste of how PyTest works, what is the syntax. So you will have in the breakout room plenty of time to practice yourself. So it's not needed to code along, but yeah, not forbidden either, of course, but not needed. So you can just relax and have a look at this PyTest overview. Okay, so uh, I'll rerun the test to show the output again. So we wrote the function. Let's look at the file. So we have this function and then to test, we create a function whose name starts with the test underscore. And then with the assert keyword to assert, check that the returned output matches the ground truth. Now, uh, okay, first I guess I need to make this a little smaller. If uh, we run uh, the PyTest, PyTest uh, simple file. Now we see that uh, says assertion failed. So it was uh, expecting uh, good morning, but it actually returns good afternoon. So it prints an error that uh, it failed. And this is useful when debugging. Now let's fix the error. So let's go back to the file. Now let's uh, return the good morning as expected. And let's test again. And now it says, nice, it uh, passed the test in 0 0.06 seconds. So take home lesson, uh, PyTest uh, is the command to test. Uh, when you write a test for a function, start the name of the function with the test underscore. And actually, I'm not sure if you actually need to have after test underscore the name matching the function if it's just good practice. Do you know, Johan, if it's compulsory? Oh, that, that, that's a good point. Um, I, I've always done it like that, and I think it's a good habit, but yeah. um, uh, it might be that it's not strictly necessary. Yeah. But perhaps yeah. someone, if someone knows you, you, you could perhaps comment on it yeah. on the, in the HackMD. Yeah. But when in doubt, do it. Yeah. So start with uh, test underscore assert keyword to check equality. And in the breakout rooms, uh, you will get the opportunities to practice with a couple of exercises. Uh, so can you we... now, can you show the, where we are in the lesson material? Yeah, sure. Just a second. Yeah, so, so, so in, in this exercise, you will be working with the uh, pie tests. And there are, uh, there's first uh, a shorter exercise. And uh, there's also some optional exercises that you can get going with if you have time to do so. Yeah. So we are in this testing locally chapter and this exercise will practice about using PyTest. And the first exercise is uh, similar to what we just did. So uh, some uh, basic uh, practice with the PyTest syntax. And then you have uh, a second optional exercise which will consider some small floating point gotchas also that you can think about. Okay, good yeah. look at. Then we know uh, what we are to work on the next 15 minutes. So it's now 34 past the full hour. So uh, we, you will uh, have 15 minutes to work on this. So we meet again 49 after the full hour. Yeah, and uh, will we will have the break straight after this. Or... Yeah. We, I think we, we reconvene for, for a, a short summary. Yeah, okay. Okay, there was a HackMD question or comment to remind people this should be done inside of the code refinery environment. Is that correct? Yes, that, that, that's a good question. Yes, uh, you can do it within the code refinery environment because then you have PyTest uh, available. Okay, see you later.
Okay, we're back, I think. Can you hear me, Johan? Yes, I can hear you. So, so, so yeah. welcome, welcome back, everyone, of the, the exercise session. Yeah. I hope you have been able to make progress. And, and uh, I think, look, we, we had a, a few good uh, questions being raised on the HackMD. So perhaps you could highlight yeah. some of these. Yes. So I think there was a question about having multiple assertions, like if the order matters, like in which you test the, the in, in which order you write the test, like if you first write assert as something equal one, then assert as some function equal two, and so on. Uh, so I don't think at least that the order should matter in my opinion, but correct me if you disagree, because I think if the order did matter, it would be in that mean that when you run the function, you would, uh, that function would change probably some global state, would change some global variables, so it wouldn't be a pure function, would have some strong side effects, which would be very prone to errors, I guess. So. I think it should be, maybe there are, like if it's necessary to have this kind of change in global state, maybe in that case, the order does matter. But I think for pure functions, at least it shouldn't matter. So functions that depend only on the input. Or what do you think, Johan? Do you have yeah, some cases the, in mind the, where- This is a, a good point. So, so for the, the as such statements on their own are independent. But as you said, Luca, if the underlying code that you're testing, if that is changing global states, then nevertheless, the order in which you execute the such statements yeah. will matter. Yeah, and uh, thinking. So, so, so then that might give you then some spurious results when running the test. However, that also raises the, the notion that, okay, here you have something in your code, which is perhaps not really deterministic because if you do A before B, it will, might be different than doing B before A. Yeah. So there was a question also on the approx functionality. Yeah. So I think we could go through that exercise a little and demo. Yeah. Uh, before that, I could uh, uh, show a small thing. So uh, now you don't need to type along, 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 along. I just want to show a small thing to understand the approx better, I think. So, uh, okay, now I'm in Julia, but probably you could do the same in Python. It's just that in Julia, I knew the word, the function by heart, which I need. But this is exactly the same in Python because floating point is standardized. So floating point is how you represent decimal numbers like 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and it's a standard. So it is, or at least should be the same everywhere. So I type 0 0.1, okay? Uh, it prints at 0 0.1, but the mind blowing thing is that this is not 0 0.1 actually. So when I type 0 0.1, this is a floating point number, which is very close to 0 0.1, but not exactly that. And I can re reveal it if I convert it to big number, so arbitrary precision. And now we see that when I print it, it's not exactly 0 0.1, it's 0, it's 0 0.1, 0, 0, 0, 0, at some point, 5, 5, 5, 1, 1, 1, and so on. So already before starting the computations, I'm already doing an approximation error at this point. So this is the key point to understand when you work with floating point numbers that nothing is what it looks like actually. So even when you type 0 0.1, it's not exactly 0 0.1. And uh, this leads to the trick in that trap that uh, why can you just do 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2 equals 0 0.3? If uh, I first uh, compute in floating point normal and uh, convert to big, and then convert to 0 0.3, then we see that these are actually two different numbers. So, so I start with uh, a number, which is not quite 0 0.1, a number, which is not quite 0 0.2. I sum them and uh, I get a number which is not quite 0 0.3, but the right answer is a number which is still not quite 0 0.3, but it's different in a different way still. So I don't get what I want in any way, practically. I all get some approximate results because floating point cannot represent all numbers. And so when I have these approximation errors, I need to be very careful when working with floating point numbers, because these are also very, very tricky to debug if you hit like this. Uh, annoying uh, floating point corner cases. So, so it, now, yeah. Yeah, th th this is nice to illustrate. And, and uh, 
if you would like to uh, dwell deeper into to this aspect of, of uh, floating point precision, we have a reference in, in the lesson material to, to a web page, yeah. which is discussed in length. Yeah, the famous watch every Sunday so should know about floating point numbers from exactly. 1991. It's I wish somebody brought a more modern version with more visualization, but that's a very great reading. I can warmly recommend that if you work with floating point numbers. But now let's uh, go to the exercise. So I'll uh, create uh, an, uh, a file where I will write the exercise. And I think someone asked me why my uh, color is different. So I use Vim, I'm using Vim here. And uh, I think that's some Vim default uh, syntax highlight. Uh, so I'm not sure, but just the syntax highlight that I have here. And I had choose this uh, a few time back because I thought it was particularly clear for bro when broadcasting, when teaching. But if I did the wrong choice and you think it's not clear the colors I use, please let me know and I will try to improve it for the next time. But now let's create this example.py file. And now uh, let's create this add function. So I'll call it add, takes two numbers a and b, and then return a plus b. And now let's write a test for it. Def uh, test add. Uh, no, I don't need input, sorry. And now I will uh, assert that uh, add of 0 0.1 and 0 0.2 will be equal to 0 0.3. And now by the discussion that we just had, we would expect this to fail. Let's save and let's test. Py test. And again, uh, you don't have to type it longer if you don't want to. So it's just okay to sit back and relax. So as uh, you prefer, but if you want, you can too, but that's uh, similar to the material in the exercise. So you can just relax and watch. And now it fails. And why it fails? Because of the discussion we had before that uh, this is not 0 0.1 and this is not 0 0.2. So the sum is not 0 0.3. 0 0.3 is not even 0 0.3. But they are still, not, not only, they are both different from the true number that we want, but they're also different from each other. So it fails. And uh, OK, so what do we do to test with floating point numbers? Uh, one possibility is uh, to test that, uh, so what we want to do is that uh, to test that, that sum is about 0 0.3. So one approach would be to use uh, absolute precision. So I'll uh, store the sum in a variable called the result. Okay. And then I will test that uh, this result is close enough to 0 0.3. And how do I do it? I will uh, compute uh, the distance difference between result uh, and my ground truth uh, in absolute value and test that uh, this is smaller than uh, a very small number. Uh, I think one e minus seven maybe should be enough. Let's try with that and let's see if it's close enough. So now I'm testing, uh, oh, I'm missing the assert. I'm testing uh, that this result is close enough to zero dot three. Now let's test, and now it passes, so it closes enough. Uh, the disadvantage of this uh, absolute tolerance approach, which I used, uh, where uh, I just uh, mm, I just computed the distance, uh, is that this approach is kind of bad if two numbers are very close to uh, zero, for example, if there are small numbers, like if uh, the result was supposed to be uh, one e minus seven and I get uh, 2e minus 7. In absolute distance uh, is uh, close, uh, but relatively that's twice uh, the number which I was expecting. Uh, is it good? Is it bad? Well, there's not a silver bullet. It depends on the application that you're doing. In some cases, it's very bad. In some cases, it's OK. Anyway, uh, one thing that you can do if you want to a more robust uh, testing uh, framework is that uh, you can uh, use from uh, PyT the PyTest library, the approx function. So from uh, uh, PyTest import uh, approx. Uh, and this function will uh, test the approximate equality. 
So now, how do I use it? I write, I assert that uh, uh, this uh, add of 0 0.1 and 0 0.2 is uh, approximately equal approx to 0 0.3. So this is the PyTest Py test syntax to use uh, the approx. And I don't need this line anymore now. And uh, so I'm not 100% sure, but I think that what this will do, it will use a relative tolerance. So it will compute the difference between the, uh, the computed value and the expected value and check that that distance, uh, that difference is at most a small percentage of the expected value. And I think we checked by default it was 1 million. So yes. I think, yeah, it's at most like 1 million relative, one per, one per million relative error, 1 millionth relative error. So the PyTest also has a special treatment for when you're working with the uh, floating point numbers that are close to zero, because then you have a special iteration where you might have division by zero and so forth. Okay, uh, I was just having a quick look at the hack and git that was missing functions. Um, now we can test if it works, hmm? and it works. Yeah, there is a fun question. Uh, what does assert if you use like 2.1 and 3.0 and uh, you compute the sum, it should be 5.1. In that case, if you do the naive, it works apparently. And if you do the non naive one, I mean, if you, but if you do the with 0 0.1 and 0 0.2 and 0 0.3, it doesn't. But then if you do 2.1 and 3, it works. I mean, in general, it depends by rounding. So there's, uh, because you know, floating point, what it does when you compute the sum, it uses a few extra bit and then it rounds so that the floating point number that you get will be the closest floating point number to the true result. And then when you start with another floating point number, which is not anyway what you want, it depends on which direction it rounds. So it's not really deterministic. But in this specific case, why 2.1 plus 3 works is because the 3 is an integer. And uh, uh, if you use a 64 bits, integers which are smaller than uh, like, I think a few millions are actually exactly representable. So when you do 2.1 plus 3, you don't have rounding error because you're rounding a small integer and that is exactly representable as floating point number. So you have an exact addition in that specific case. Yeah. Nice. So uh, yeah, we have now got a little bit more insight in, in how we yeah. can be deal with floating point numbers uh, in the context of testing. I don't know if you uh, can see that they work with computer arithmetic in my work, but. Uh... So uh, we are now at, at the full hour. So it's time that we go for a break and the clock is two past full hour. So we will have the break up until 12 past the full hour. And when we convene, we will continue with automate testing. So see you in 10 minutes. So welcome back everyone after the break. So uh, before going to the next episode, we would like to announce that in the remaining of this lesson, we will have type along of some coding. So uh, the idea is here that you follow what you're doing. So you, you, ne you need not to type along. And that applies also to, to the next lesson in the day that will also be type along. So what we're going to look at now is automated testing and continuous integration. So perhaps, uh, Luca, you could uh, introduce what this is about the exercise. Yeah, so uh, what uh, we're going to do here, uh, uh, Johan is going to demo and I'm going to uh, DJ questions from the HackMD and uh, comment and discuss so that we get some interactivity. And uh, the purpose of this exercise is to show how we can use uh, uh, tests in uh, GitHub. Uh, well, uh, we will use GitHub here, but it applies also similarly to other services. So how we can integrate with uh, testing a thing that we have been discussing here to the previous things that we learned in the 
workshop uh, like with the collaborative workflow on GitHub uh, and so on. So how do we bring tests from our local working to the Git world, to the GitHub world? How do we bring them online, so to speak? Um, do you have, Johan, something to add about this? Um, no, I, I think it's good that we, we get going. So we, we will work now with uh, with the uh, numbers, continue to that, but now we will work with integer numbers. So you can relax about this with the floating point arithmetics. So other things will be tested. And we are going to do this on GitHub and GitLab. Uh, yeah. Or we, we are going to do this on, on GitHub. Uh, should the learners follow and repeat the same, or should they just sit back and relax and watch the show? Uh, no, the idea is yeah, that, that, that you follow what we are doing yeah. in, in the screen. So the very first step here is that we will create a new repository on GitHub or GitLab, but I will do it on, on GitHub. So I will now switch over to GitHub. And I will create a um, repository. Yeah, so, so while I'm typing, look at them, perhaps you can explain what, what I'm doing. Yeah, so uh, Johan is now creating a new repository which will host uh, this uh, code that we will be working on with, uh, with this addition code. And um, we will demo how you can automatically run the tests every time you push to that repository. So, the main advantage, I guess, is that since it's automated, you don't need to manually do it every time, but every time you open a PR, for example, or push to some branch, it will automatically run all the tests. Yes, yeah, so this repository was now created with just the one readme from the start. And I okay. clone it to the computer. Do you have generally uh, continuous integration in your repositories when you work? No, I actually do not have it uh, for the repositories I'm working with, but, but uh, in, in some other code that I'm using, this is uh, up, up and, uh, and active. Yeah, I think it's nice to have the continuous integration. The very nice thing is that uh, you can test on different operating systems, uh, whereas when you test locally, you generally do it only on one operating system, so it's more robust, uh, I guess, in that case. But you can generally, in, your com in my computer, I have one version of the language at one operating system. But uh, then with continuous integration, you can test on several operating systems with uh, several versions of different dependencies, so it's Pretty nice. Yes. So perhaps uh, we could say what I did there was I, I was adding this example code uh, with an addition function and a subtraction function. And there is a test for the addition. So you could see here, yeah, test for addition, uh, but not yet a test for subtraction. And I ran the test here. And locally on the computer, everything was, was passing uh, with PyTest. Everything was OK. Then we add the example to, uh, to the staging area. And we commit it. Uh, that addition test. So there's a question, HackMD, when you said before, follow the screen, someone was wondering if uh, follow means type along or just watch. 
yeah, it, it, it's just to watch. So I committed it and then I push. And we have now this um, commit being made here. And uh, what I'm going to do now is to activate the continuous integration. So I go to actions here and I choose the button Python application. Press the configure button. And here you can see there's a template here for the code which needs to be executed in order to run the test with PyTest. So what I need to do here at the very bottom is to uh, just specify that the file which is to be run is the example.py. Then I start a commit. And uh, I write here that I added uh, git Hub action for running tests. Uh, someone missed where you pressed. Like someone is asking, how uh, where did you press to add the workflow? Yes, so. I was pressing. So here in the main canvas for, for the, the repo, you have this button actions. If I press here. I can then add a workflow by pressing here, new workflow. And this is what I was just doing now a minute ago. Mm. Also, in the, yeah, also in the material, we have screenshots of these, I think. So you can check the pictures also in the material. We have screenshots of the browser, where to click and what button to choose. Yes. So this test has now been uh, automatically run on the GitHub servers. And this has executed then with passing the test. So you can see that you have this green check mark here indicating that everything was fine. We could also go back to actions here. And if you press here, we get some information on what has been done. So you can see here that it was triggered one minute ago. The status was a success. And that the total duration was 18 seconds. So, I mean, 18 seconds is, of course, a lot for running this test, but, but, but it depends on, on the load on the server, naturally. So, everything looks fine now, but... Uh, so, we pulled... I, I now pulled locally on my computer to get this YAML file on a local repo, and this YAML file which is uh, defining the GitHub action for running tests. Now we we'll now I will now activate the test which is testing for the subtraction in the code. So I'll uncomment these lines, which are doing a test for the subtraction. And if you look above here on the functions that we have, the addition function and the subtraction function, you can see that something is a little bit fishy with the subtraction. Anyhow, we, we leave it like this and then we save and go out. And uh, we add this file and uh, we commit it straight away here. Oh, sorry, we, we should perhaps here. So, so look, what's the appropriate thing? Should we work in the main branch? Perhaps we should not. Uh, hmm. I yeah, maybe should we work by via PR? What do you think? Yes, yeah, so we, we should or... work in, in, in a feature branch. So I'll check out so, this. Uh, someone in Hackmd says that you uncommented the line that should not be uncommented. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, Observation. Yeah. yeah. 
So I will then uh, make a branch um, run subtraction test and check out this. Or, or sorry. Mm. Yeah, I think it's good. Or, or no, the next thing. Well, okay. We, we. Oh, sorry. We, we, we should have committed this in, in the main branch. We, we, we stay, we look, we are in the main branch. Yes. And, and, and we add. We have added it here. Yeah, and then we correct also here because this comment was here. That should be a comment. So, so thank you for pointing this out. And then we save again. And we go out. And now we commit it. And we do this to main because we are working here just on our own. Get up a subtraction test, and then we push. If we now go back to the repo on GitHub, you can see here now that the GitHub action is running here. So you can see that this uh, yellow button is, uh, is uh, with a yellow. It's not red, it's not green, but it's working. And then we wait and, and see how it goes. And um, I think it will be not any surprise then that this test will I refresh here so it goes faster. Can you yes. run? Uh, it has failed. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, uh, can you run uh, how many tests and how big tests? Like if you had like a lot of code, a lot of tests, could you, that would take hours. Can you run those on the GitHub workflow or at least on the free plan or are there some limitations on how much resources you Yeah, that, that's a good, I, the, the, there are limitations, yes. But, but you can then, uh, if you choose then to, to use the, the paid for services, you, you can add capacity. So if you go now to the, actions bottom here, we can see that the add subtraction test has been failing. What we do here is that we add an issue here, put the issue button, create new issue, now write a subtraction uh, is failing. We submit new issue. We then go back to our local repo, and uh, now is the time we do a feature branch. So git branch fix subtraction, fix sub. We check out. And then we work. Sorry, this was, uh, we, we work in, in this file. And what we need to do obviously is to correct here that it should be A minus B. And then we save. And we add this file and we commit. And in the commit message, we will now write that we have fixed subtraction. Well, yeah, corrected, you can write corrected. And here we then mention fixes issue number one. And we push. And uh, we do that to the upstream origin fix sub. OK. 
Okay, we are then back to So we can now uh, see that we had a, a, had a commit here to fix this issue. So, so look at it. So, so how, how um, be, be, before making a pull request, we, we need to uh, run this example. And um, we should then go to the fix sub branch. And uh, we should execute the action for it. Yeah. I think you have you set up how is the your workflow script? Huh? Yeah, so the, the action is here for. Running for the okay. We 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 do the pull request because we we know that yeah. this is going to work. So 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 we we go back here and we make a pull request. Create a subtraction. Fix this one. We create a pull request. And yeah, no, it's now the check is running. Yeah, so, yeah. so the, the thing that I was uh, here curious about whether I was able to run the continuous inter interact integration test yeah. while being on the feature branch. And this was apparently not launched directly, but now when I make the pull request, then the test is running. Yeah. Maybe we can show the YAML file and see from that uh, why that was happening. Mm -hmm. if yeah, so anyhow, now it's executed uh, when doing the pull request and everything is fine and we can watch it. Confirm it. Corrected subtraction fixes one. We can then delete the feature branch. Good. So, um, yeah, and, and now actually the action is running once again here. So it was doing then it while we were being on, on the pull request and then after having accepted it. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think if you look at the YAML file, we can read from that in the GitHub workflow folder in the repository. Yeah. Yeah, from the file, I think we can see if it runs only on push to some branches or if it runs on pull request to some branches so um, yeah it has yes. on uh, he, he to, yeah to... exactly it, it, it executes here on pushing to main and on when we're doing pull requests to main yeah so that's good good to highlight yeah. How do you do generally? Do you have do you run branches only on pull requests and when pushing to main? Uh, sorry, do you run workflows only on pull requests or, or whenever you push to some branches and whenever you push you open? I, I, I would say main? that 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 the better thing here would be to do the to run the action when you are in the feature branch already, so that you know before committing that. Uh, you have something that, 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 that will actually fix, fix the issue. But then, oh, I mean, something might then need to be corrected when you are doing the merge. So uh, the, the things, yes, but, but because it, it works when you're on the feature branch, does not necessarily guarantee that, that it will work when you have been attempting to do the, the merge. Yeah. I generally, in my codes, I have set up the workflow so that it runs tests when I open a pull request to main, when I push to main, and when I have tax, when I make tax. So hmm. in those cases, oh, well, when I open pull requests and when it push to main through merge commit or direct push, or and when it, I make releases or on tax, so when it makes tax. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, okay, we have now demonstrated the, an example of continuous integration. We're working here on GitHub and uh, we will now move on to the last part of the lesson. And here we will look on a few variants of, of test design. And, and Luca, you're going to, to show this. So do you want to take the screen? Uh, yeah, just a second. Yeah, I can take over the screen. Yeah, so now I took over. And um, do, do you think you have my terminal setup is wide enough? I think before it was too narrow. Do you think it's readable? It, it no? looks good, it looks good. Yeah. So uh, what we are going to do now, we're going through this, uh, roughly going to, through this, uh, test uh, design exercise. And uh, the idea actually now is not to code. Well, we will code, but that's not the main beef of now. The main idea is to show how we approach the problem and uh, how in general we test, how do we design our strategy? Like, okay, now I need to code and I need to write tests. What do I do? So that's the main question, like this mindset of test-driven design and uh, writing tests uh, while designing and uh, so on. And uh, I needed uh, to pick up a language. So now we are going to use Julia for this, uh, mainly for the fact uh, that it's pretty readable and just to have some variants, you know, that show that there are different tools you can use. But uh, you don't, first of all, you don't need to code now. So you can just uh, sit back, relax, watch, uh, and uh, really focus on the HackMD. And, uh, but if you really, really want to do it, uh, in the materials, uh, you can find also scripts in different languages. So you can pick the language uh, you want. I think there's Python, Julia, R, Fortran, C++ at least. But what we really suggest now is that you focus on the HackMD. So we really suggest that you have this in portrait mode and uh, on the left uh, right side of your screen and next to it HackMD. And uh, you focus on uh, commenting. What we are doing. So if you see that, uh, if you don't disagree, if you disagree with what I'm doing, you say, "Hey, hey, you should test that. Say that." Or, "Hey, hey, I would do that." So the purpose of this is to have interactivity discussion, because the main message here is that you cannot test code alone because you are you are one person. You think in one way, and especially if you have written your code yourself, you will become blind to your own mistakes. And so the main message here is that when you code. And when you test your code, you really need other people to look at it because otherwise you will become blind to your own mistake and uh, oversee things. So please, uh, HackMD, now let it come, all comments, ideas, everything, just uh, flow it in HackMD and let's get uh, started. So I'm curious on how would you design a test for function that calculates a factorial of a number? So, so I know we have something prepared on this. So perhaps you could uh, share, yeah, so, you, the, the, I mean, view uh, a code snippet for this. Yeah, uh, should I type it or do you think it's okay if I just copy paste it? To see you, I think you can type. copy paste it. Okay, yeah, so I'll uh, open it. Yeah, and uh, Luca will here use the Julia language for the sake of variation, but we also then have this template code for various languages. So you can explore yeah. that on your own later. Yeah, so I'm creating this file factorial.gl where I'm now copy pasting the Julia code that you can find from the materials the exercise design one. Yeah, here we go. Oh, I don't have syntax out. I'm sorry for that. Okay, so um, here we have the function. So it takes a factorial and it has to be an integer. Um, just in case you don't know what the factorial is, uh, the factorial of a number is the product of the number itself with all the previous ones. So I can write here in the doc string that the factorial of n is n times n minus one times n minus two times uh, so on. 
So the product of the number and all the previous numbers. That's uh, the factorial function. So, and uh, in Julia, to test, uh, we use uh, this, uh, well, test package, which is built in. And then uh, this test uh, macro, but that's not important, just language details. The idea is uh, what should I test now? Do you have a suggestion, Johan? So I need to test this function. How would you test the factorial? Yeah, so I, perhaps good to test the base cases. So what is the factorial yeah. for zero and factorial for one? Yeah, so factorial for zero, this should be by definition one. And then, oh, sorry. Equal, equal, one. And then I would test that the factorial for one is also one. Yeah. Uh, so these are, yeah, the, the basis cases. Should we test, do you think it it's, gets redundant if we test uh, like some number like three, five, like a smallish one? So no, it doesn't, that, it, yeah. That's highly relevant. And moreover, I think it uh, would be good to test what happens if you, if you enter a negative number? Because yeah. the factorial is not defined for negative numbers. Yeah. So uh, here I would test that it uh, throws an error. And in July, it's this test that throws call. And I should check in this case that it throws a domain error of the factorial of minus one. So this is testing that when I call factorial of minus one, negative number, it will uh, throw a domain error. Should we test the it, test? Yes, I, I think this stuff is for a start. So we have already here four asserted statements. It would be interesting to see how all of these come out. Yeah. Yeah, it uh, says that the tests are passed. Yeah, it didn't print that many details. Maybe uh, one thing that we could do to make it clear, we could uh, wrap this in a test set. This will uh, cluster the tests in one group and we'll call it the test sets and uh, check that. Uh, um, so, so please note here that uh, here we already did in the function as written, it did have this check for the argument being smaller than zero. So the function was already handling the case of negative number input in a correct way. Yeah. Good, um, I think we have some interesting uh, example uh, further down in the lesson material, which is yeah. something which is called uh, the FIS bus uh, yeah. uh, code, uh, yeah. which will take a number and then output some text. Okay. Okay. There's. Uh, is there in the HackMD some suggestion we should uh, test uh, some other tests we should add before we move to the next one? Um, how does it work for non integers? Yeah, the gamma function, for example. So, if I write a floating point, we should, I guess, we should test that it throws an error in that case. Also, like if I try to, yeah, that's, that's, that's a good point. One, uh, one. Yeah. One, one, one could add a search statement for, 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 for that. Yeah. Um, that's a good point. Uh, Yes, so, so perhaps we can introduce a little bit uh, this. Uh, it's the design exercise six, which is the so-called FISPAS function. And that is constructed. So it takes an integer argument. And for arguments that are multiples of three, it returns FIS. For arguments that are multiples of five, it returns a bus. And if the arguments are multiples of both three and five, it returns a FIS bus. So this okay. is then a, a mixture of uh, arithmetics and of string processing in this. Yeah, interesting. Should we get started? Yes.
to fits paths dot gl okay and now i guess the idea is that we first write the test and then uh, write to the function so that it start it uh, fits the test so the test pass isn't it yes yeah so um okay first i'll import the test library uh, so I think we could start by uh, defining the function. So uh, should I call it fist pass? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I will, uh, this function will do nothing. We just uh, return uh, I don't exist yet. So that I know that I will need this function. So I define the function, but it's doing nothing. It's just similar to the Python pass. And now uh, let's start writing some tests. So uh, what was the specification? If it's divisible by three, it should return uh, fits, isn't yes. it? Yeah. So what would be a good test for that? Maybe the easiest number, which is divisible by three, I guess is a three. So we could test, and again, I'll wrap it in a test set. I should uh, test uh, that uh, this bus of uh, three is equal to uh, fit. Should it be case sensitive or unsensitive? Yeah, that doesn't matter. Okay, let's make it uh, lower for the moment. Um, actually, one thing that I will do now is that because I know that it will fail, I'll mark it as broken. So I can tell that the test is broken. So that's something I do when I first write the test. Since I haven't written the code, I know that the test will not will fail because I haven't written the code. So I already tell that the test is broken. And this is handy because once I've written the code, if a broken test passes, if a broken test passes, then uh, Julia will tell me, hey, you said this set is broken, but it actually works. So I think you fix that. So it helps in test-based design. So yeah, then uh, what other test should I put? Yeah, if, if it's uh, divisible by five, you should output uh, a bus. Uh, okay, if divisible by five, it should output the bus bus. Yeah, mm, I think that I saw a question. Uh, why use a test broken and not just fits bus uh, three uh, diverse uh, from fits? Uh, yeah, so as I said, like this, uh, what this test broken does. Uh, yeah, it uh, checks the test, and if it, the test fails, it says, okay, the test is broken, but you're expecting it, so it's your choice. But then actually, if uh, it uh, passes the broken test, it will warn me that, uh, hey, hey, this is fixed now, so it shouldn't be broken. So that's the reason. Oh, and uh, I here, I should have equal equal. Then uh, I guess a basic test would be to test that uh, when I give uh, 15, so if it was divisible by 15, it should be fits pass. Yeah. Uh, what else? What if it's not divisible by three, by five, or 15? What should the, the code do? Then it should uh, output nothing. Nothing. It, should, yeah. it doesn't. Yeah, 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 just an empty string. Okay, an empty string. Yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe we can uh, decide that if we return uh, instead of empty string, like something else uh, as a string. Uh, or, yeah. Yeah. And so a number which is not divisible by 3, 5, 15, uh, I guess 2, it should be something else. Yes, something else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I have broken. Yeah. So um, I, I think uh, per perhaps we, we have some template code in the lesson material. So perhaps uh, we, we could um, use some of that um, for, for, for. Yeah, so should I start writing the code? 
Yes, and, 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 and then my suggestion is that you, you use the template code that we have in the lesson material. Yeah. And just paste it in here. Yeah. Because the important here is the, the sign of the tests. Hmm. But, um, actually, I would like not to directly copy paste. How much time do we have? Do we have I mean, yeah, uh, we, we, we don't have so much time. So that, for that reason, I think it might be good if you. Yeah. Copy. Okay, I'll just copy paste. Thank mm -hmm. like, you. Yeah. And here we agree this should return a string. So something else. Okay, let, let's uh, run it like this. Okay. What do you think? I think that sounds good because you yeah. have here a complete uh, function that is implementing the this bus yeah. calculation. But, uh, yeah, actually, I would like to swap these lines here, the 3 and 15. We'll see it soon what. Okay, so uh, I've written the function. Should I start running this? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'll include the pissbats.gl file. Okay, and here you see now I got something right. Wow, not bad for the first try. Mm. Because what is telling me when I had the test of this pass two equals something else, it's telling me that hey, you got the correct result. Please change to test if no longer broken. So as I actually did get something right now, as I marked it as as broken before, now it's telling me hey, it was broken, but it seems working. So have a cookie and change to test. So I will not have a cookie at the moment, but I can fix the test. This one. But then uh, the other ones were failing. And uh, let's run again and see now what happens. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, yeah, it says that. We have, uh, we have here um, uh, in, in the function as defined, we have uh, the strings are written via the leading capital letter. Yeah. So that's one bug. Yeah. If you make that match. Yeah. Uh, should we, yeah, I think let's pretend I'm, I noticed that. Now let's try. So let's run again. Okay, we have one pass, uh, two, bro two broken. Oh yeah, now it says me again, hey, now there are some tests that pass. So it says that, hey, this piece pass five return pass is correct. So now I know that this is uh, fixed, I can fix it. Uh, so it was this uh, fist pass of five. Maybe I think uh, one small downside of this test broken is that it shows me one broken test at a time. It, I think I could somehow like uh, tell him uh, run all the tests and tell me all the broken tests that pass at the same time, but it's kind of outside the scope of this. And again, it says that this piece pass of three passes. So these passes. And let's see now. Okay, so now three passes and one is still broken. So uh, what I would do now is that uh, instead of having it as broken, I will uh, move it to test for the reason that I know it's broken, but if, if I mark it that it is broken, it will not show me the error message because it just says, yeah, you know it's broken, I know it's broken, we're all happy. But now, since I want to fix that, actually, I will move it to normal test so that it will print the error message. Uh, yeah, and let's run here. Okay, so now it failed. And it says evaluated fits to fits pass. Okay, so it says that I should return fits pass, but it returned 
fits. Uh, so let's see why. Okay. So it return fits, so it tends to this branch, but it should return fits paths, so it should go here. So it looks like uh, it stopped here. And now maybe, maybe if uh, I'm not tired, I could realize, oh yeah, of course, because uh, if it's divisible by 15, it's also divisible by three. So probably I should change the order of these two branches. Because uh, if uh, I first check if it's divisible by three, also the numbers which are divisible by 15 will uh, pass, will uh, get stuck here. So probably I should swap these two. So I'll do it. And let's see now. Could you not close Vim in between the different tests? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, now passes everything. I will reopen it. Just don't have it here. Yeah. So now we got a full pass for, for all of these tests. That is good. Uh, yeah, it's great for your self-esteem to pass tests. Um, yeah, I leave the beam open. Sorry for that. Uh, what else should we test? Yes, yeah, so I mean, we, we now have had two working examples for test design, for the factorial function, and for the FISPAS function. And to uh, wrap up this uh, sec episode about test design, we, we could just very briefly in, in Word, uh, but, but without writing code, we, we can comment a little bit about testing random numbers. Yeah. So if you uh, take up that page on the lesson, if you scroll down to the Yatsi yeah. test. Yeah, should we write some code or just? Uh... No, no, we're not, not writing code, but just to show it. Yeah, yeah, I will show you. Yes, so uh, we would uh, briefly just uh, say a few words about one exercise we have in the, in the bottom of the material, uh, which is a test on a program implementing the Yatsi game. And yeah. the Yatsi game, involves random numbers. So when you're working with random numbers, you add an additional component to, uh, to the floating point arithmetics or to integral arithmetics. And um, there are two important aspects here. One of them is this that in the computers are by design deterministic. So uh, tests are appropriate both for the purpose of uh, testing uh, in a controlled random number sequence so that you have a deterministic execution of the, the whole program when running with an identical random number sequence. Or you can also look on the statistical aspect of the random numbers that you are yeah. getting. And uh, here, when you are, are calculating some variable for, for random numbers, uh, I mean, the expected mean value will converge to some value uh, depending on how many attempts you're doing, how many times you're calling the function. And, but you will have a spread of this, a standard deviation, yeah. which is depending then on, on, on how many times you're running uh, the code. So, so these are aspects which are important when you run random numbers. So I, I think uh, time doesn't allow to enter into the details here, but it's an interesting example that, that we encourage you to if you're interested to have a look on uh, in, in the language of, of your choice. Um, and I think, uh, are there some additional comments that we would like to wrap up the lesson with? Or we should perhaps, if not, I, I think we could just yeah, summarize with, with, yeah, testing is something that, that should be considered to be an integrated part of software development. And it has a strong 
connection also to, to revenue yeah. stability of code. Do you generally set the random seed when you test for randomness? Uh, uh, sorry? When you have some randomness in your codes and your functions, do you set the random seed generally so that it's reproducible, it's exactly the same? Or yes, I, I, I typically do that, yes. Um, that's the base case. And, and then I also use we, we, we have arbitrary random number seeds. And then for running the, the programs, I'm, I'm using arbitrary random number seeds. That was a little bias as possible. Okay, uh, so I think with that, uh, we can conclude this episode and we will now have uh, a break. And that will be uh, in 10 minutes and it's now the full hour. So we will reconvene with the, with the last episode, with the, with the last lesson of the workshop at 10 past the full hour. So see you in 10 minutes. Bye. Bye.